On April 26, 2025, I returned from a wonderful trip to Spain and Portugal, intending to do a video on the Spanish grid operator's success in transitioning to renewable energy. The country generates about 75% of their electricity from low carbon sources, including nuclear wind and solar power. Then, just after noon on April 28th, almost all of Spain and Portugal, the Iberian Peninsula, lost electricity for hours. And a power outage is not just an inconvenience. People were stuck in elevators and trains. Medical devices stopped working. Food spoiled. Traffic lights went offline. At least seven people died. By morning, almost everyone had power back. There are those who jumped to blame renewable energy as the cause of the power outage. Is that fair? Is net zero impossible because we'll be plagued by power outages like this one? And if so, is there a way to prevent power outages caused by a grid dominated by renewable resources? Let's look into it. The authorities have yet to explain what happened, but we know it wasn't a lack of energy produced by Spain's renewable resources. Just before the outage, Spain was exporting power to France, Morocco, Portugal, and pumping water uphill for storage. And over 50% of the electricity generated at that time was from solar. So the problem definitely wasn't Dunkelflaute, the German word for dark lull, and describes a period when both wind and solar power production is low. Before we dive into what happened, some background on how the electricity grid works. The grid is more than just wires and transformers and power plants. Everything that's plugged in becomes part of the grid. Let's start with some terms. Alternating current is when the voltage goes up and down in a regular fashion. The frequency is how often the voltage goes through a cycle, measured in hertz. The voltage is the potential, sort of like the height of a waterfall tells you how much energy will be released as the water falls. And a change in phase moves when the voltage will be at its peak. The grid operates with alternating current. Depending on where you live, the voltage will go up and down in a sine wave fashion 50 or 60 times a second, or hertz. As an interesting bit of trivia, in half of Japan it's at 50 hertz and the other half operates at 60 hertz. The European grid operates at 50 hertz. And at every moment, the power flowing into the grid from solar panels and nuclear reactors must exactly match the power consumed by lights, computers, and microwave ovens. This isn't as hard to manage as you'd think, as normally the grid demand changes slowly, since for every person turning on their microwave, someone else is turning their computer off. Every generator has to operate at the same frequency, voltage, and phase. Power is moved from the generators on high voltage lines, and everywhere across this part of the grid, the voltage will be the same at all times. If this wasn't the case, one generator would be increasing the voltage while another was decreasing it, leading to an unstable grid. If there's too much power being poured onto the grid, then the frequency will go up. If there's not enough power, then the frequency goes down. And if the frequency isn't what it's supposed to be, that's a problem. Damaging equipment and even causing clocks to display the wrong time. There are two kinds of power plants on the grid. First, we'll look at the old-fashioned kind, where a turbine is turned by either high-pressure steam or flowing water, and the turbine turns a generator, which generates electricity. In the last century, almost every power plant was this type. They are all designed to operate at the proper frequency and in phase. And the large mass of the turbine and generator form what's called rotational inertia. This is very valuable for the grid operators. If demand drops a little bit and the frequency goes up a little bit, then these generators will naturally react to keep the frequency where it's supposed to be, without the operators having to take any action, and it happens instantly. The other kind of power plants are powered by wind and the sun, and these don't have generators that spin at exactly the right frequency. What they do is they take the DC power generated by the solar panels or the AC power that's generated at the wrong frequency by the wind turbines 
and pass them through a device called a grid following inverter. These inverters use electronics to sense what's going on on the grid and provide power at the same frequency and phase as is out there. Anyone who has an RV that can take battery power and run a TV or a microwave oven has an inverter that takes the DC power from the battery and turns it into AC power for your appliances. You can even stop at a truck stop and buy an inverter that plugs into your cigarette lighter and converts 12 volt power from your car into AC power that can power anything. So inverters are not as exotic as they might sound but these are not grid tied. They generate AC power at the right frequency and voltage, but they aren't synchronizing the phase with an external source. And most people with residential solar probably know that in a power outage, even if the sun is shining, they lose power as well. That's because without an external source of AC power, most inverters that convert the DC power from the solar panels can't convert it to AC power to feed your house. So now we know enough to talk about what happened in the Iberian Peninsula. We do know that there were two events five seconds apart at around 1230 in the afternoon. That was the initial cause of the problem. Some speculate that there was a disruption to exporting power to France, which caused an oversupply of power, which caused the frequency on the grid to increase. Others speculate that some large solar farms went offline, causing the grid to be undersupplied, leading the frequency to drop. I'm not going to speculate as to what was the original cause, the trigger, because it doesn't really matter. Obviously, it matters to the grid operators because they need to take actions to make sure it doesn't happen again. And people want to blame someone. But for what I'm going to talk about here, all we need to know is something triggered the frequency to deviate from the expected 50 hertz. If the Spanish grid was powered primarily by traditional power plants with a lot of inertia, they would have automatically reacted to stabilize the system, giving the grid operators a chance to respond in whatever way would stabilize the grid. Maybe by taking some sources offline if there was too much power, maybe by stopping pumping water uphill if there wasn't enough power. But the high inertia power plants would have given the operators a chance to respond. But the Spanish grid has very little rotational inertia because it gets its power mainly from power plants that use inverters, that is wind and solar. So there wasn't enough inertia on the grid to stabilize it. Let's assume the problem was a disruption with exporting power to France so there was too much power on the grid. In a fraction of a second, the frequency would go from 50 hertz to 50.01 hertz. The power plants with inertia would reduce their output to decrease the frequency, but the grid following solar and wind farms would actually increase their frequency to 50.01 hertz, making the problem worse. And since most of the power was coming from these power plants, they win and the power imbalance gets worse and the frequency goes even higher. This continues until the frequency gets so high as to exceed the limits of the inverters, causing them to all go offline at the same time. Five seconds after the initial disruption, 15 gigawatts of power dropped offline, leading to blackouts that spread across the peninsula. So whether the original cause had anything to do with renewable energy or not, we don't know. But what made the grid unstable was its lack of inertial sources. So does that mean a grid entirely run on renewable energy is inherently unstable? A fair question, and luckily the answer is no. And the solution is surprisingly simple and has already been deployed elsewhere in the world. The solution is what's called grid forming inverters. Here's a video from the U.S. National Renewable Energy Lab explaining how grid forming inverters can lead to a stable grid. You may know that inverters switch electricity from direct current to alternating current. You may also know that inverters deliver power from renewable energy resources and batteries to the electric grid. But did you know that inverters can do more? 
They have an important role to play in providing grid stability. It all depends on their controls. When inverters inject electricity into the grid, it must match the grid's existing voltage and frequency. Inverter controls can achieve this by following other generators, like ducklings following their mother. The inverter simply looks at the surrounding electricity and follows it. But this becomes a problem when all inverters are following. Then there isn't a leader, and the inverters might follow each other into unstable conditions. To overcome this, power systems with large amounts of inverter-based resources require some of the inverters to form the grid. Grid-forming inverters generate electricity to other inverters to reference, providing a rapid response to maintain stability. For example, imagine a power system with mostly grid-following inverters and some synchronous generators which don't use inverters. Imagine that an inverter trips during a storm. This causes the frequency to drop quickly while the remaining generators and inverters try to stabilize the grid. As the frequency drops below 59.5 Hz, the grid automatically begins an emergency recovery scheme that temporarily cuts supply to some areas causing local blackouts. At last, the resources restabilize the frequency, and minutes later, the power is restored. Meanwhile, grid following inverters inside the blackout cannot provide power because they have no voltage or frequency to reference. Now, imagine that all grid following inverters are replaced with grid forming inverters. This time, when a lightning strike takes out an inverter, the grid forming inverters react fast enough to stop the frequency from falling to the point where the grid sheds load. The grid remains stable, and the remaining resources rebalance the frequency to 60 Hz. Grid-forming inverters are essential to preventing outages. Are grid-forming inverters like fusion power and low-cost batteries a good idea stuck in the lab? Nope. They're out there in the world, and they've been tested by real events. In the late afternoon of April 2nd, 2023, an experiment on the value of grid-forming inverters was carried out on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. This was not like a fire drill where everything was planned out in advance for practice. No, this was a situation where the island of about 70,000 residents and 30,000 tourists were getting 60% of their power from the island's single oil-fired power plant, and it failed as the sun was setting. If not for the preparations that had been done, this would have brought the grid down for the entire island, as most of the rest of the power came from renewables through inverters. But the grid operator, the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative, had prepared for this possibility by installing grid-forming inverters at two solar battery sites. Within a second of the oil-fired power plant going offline, the frequency on the grid had dropped from 60 hertz to 59. The remaining spinning power plants were insufficient to stabilize the frequency, but the two solar battery facilities significantly increased their power within a twentieth of a second, keeping the lights on. We're seeing grid-forming inverters being installed at larger and larger facilities. For instance, one of the first large battery storage sites, the Hornsdale Power Reserve in South Australia, was upgraded with grid-forming capabilities in 2020 and a much larger facility in New South Wales, Australia, will also feature grid-forming inverters. The North American Electric Reliability Corporation recently published a recommendation that all future large-scale battery storage systems have grid-forming capability. There's a need for studies and computer simulations to optimize the design and use of grid-forming inverters. For instance, how can we change the design of grid following inverters such that they increase reliability? Maybe if the frequency is going up, we use a random number generator so that only some of the inverters go offline rather than all of them. How many grid forming inverters do we need to keep the grid stable? How do multiple grid forming inverters work together rather than fight over the proper phase?
I'm certain that the Spanish grid operator is asking exactly these questions and figuring out where they need to upgrade their existing inverters to be grid forming. But this outage wasn't a wake-up call just for Spain, but the entire world. Luckily, there's a developed and tested solution to this problem, and there's no reason anyone else needs to suffer through an outage when there's plenty of power available. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you'd like to support this channel, you can buy me a Guinness. And please share this video with anyone you know who prefers the power stays on.